and a very good morning to you all and a very warm welcome to Breakfast with Arab. I hope you're all well and happy. My name is Farah and I'm the Marketing and Communications Leader for Buildings London. And so to our speaker this morning. Tom was born in London and raised in Yorkshire. The son of two artists, as a young boy, Tom was brought up in a creative household where his family were always making things. They were keen photographers and, of course, spent a huge amount of time outdoors. As a young boy, Tom was immersed by his father's work, whose areas of inspiration for his art were the natural world, the Yorkshire landscape, and, of course, the weather. Tom also helped his father as a young child to build a greenhouse to house cacti from all over the world. So it is indeed little wonder that Tom grew up to be a landscape architect. Studying landscape architecture at Leeds University, Tom was also in a band at college called The Sofas. And one of his songs, a top song as I understand from Tom, was called Trees Are Dangerous. <laughs> After graduating, Tom boarded a National Express coach, paying five pounds for his ticket, and headed south um, for his first job near Hampton Court for a small landscaping firm. Working there for seven years, Tom was involved in a wide variety of projects here in the UK and abroad in the Middle East. An opportunity arose in 1990 for a landscape professional to join Arab. So Tom came along, interviewed, and duly joined Arab, and was the first landscape architect amongst 3,000 engineers. <laughs> Since 1990, Tom has slowly built up the business, and the group is now recognized as one of the largest landscape teams in the UK. Tom's portfolio of projects includes leading the landscape engineering team for Olympic Park South for London 2012, and leading on the concept designs through to delivery for High Speed One. Tom is currently working on Oman Botanic Gardens, which is a major conservation and education project, and is also one of the lead authors for the City's Alive report. <coughs> Tom's passion lies in innovation and pushing the value of landscape architecture. So it really is my pleasure to introduce the utterly charming Tom Armour. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Farah, for a very nice introduction. And I promise you will not get a rendition of Trees Are Dangerous this morning. <laughs> My talk was inspired by this profound statement um, in a book by Tim Waterman, The Essentials of Landscape Architecture. The history of humankind is written in the landscape. And this is true, of course. And he goes on to say that through all the centuries, through millennia, that man has always made a mark on the landscape, whether this is to provide for basic needs like food, shelter, and companionship, but also to build monuments to collective ambition. And some of these still really resonate with us today. So my talk is really about the relationship between people and the landscape. And I want to really look at where we came from and where we are now, which is here in the city. Um, this is where most of us now live in the world. This is our habitat, and we need to examine how cities work, really. So I, I shall come on to that. But just to continue with a bit of context, Tim Waterman also makes a great point that it's a paradox that we've probably never known more about our Earth, but we've probably never done more to damage it and pollute it. And I agree, rather depressing images, some beautiful images here, but these are some of the most polluted places on Earth. And I think we've reached a, a stage, and we're now living in a time where there's almost no place on Earth where we as a species have not damaged or affected the environment in some way. And I think we have to think about this, and I think we have to take responsibility, and I think we now need to really push back and remember the importance of the environment to us, and we need to do something about it, give something back. But I'm going to get us to the city, but I'm going to start a long way back. I'm really going to look at different phases of how we've related to landscape. And first of all, where we live within the natural landscape. Seven million years ago, our ancestors, 
uh, lived in the trees. This is where we all lived. And interestingly, and I think ironically, through natural climate change at the time, the forest in which we lived in thinned and uh, we reached a point where we had no choice but to descend into the grassland landscapes below. And scientists say that this descent from the trees was a key moment in the evolution of our species. Because we suddenly had to collaborate, we had to work together, we had to live in this new environment which gave us many, many challenges to overcome in terms of living, hunting, feeding ourselves. And we learned to work collaboratively and this developed our brains and we began to grow and develop and move through the ages. And I think there's a very interesting quote here. The entire evolution of our species has involved us living and working in or near grasslands. And I think that's really fundamental to me really. And I think it's such an, an interesting point um, that these, these millions of years we spent in this grassland landscape, this is where we actually come from. This is where we, our genes relate to and where we still are in fact, which I'll come to later. I'm now going to sort of jump through history, so I will miss some things out, so please don't have a go at me at the end when you <laughs> tell me I've missed the Greeks or something like that. Um, I have to jump through history because I've got 25 minutes and I need to get to the end. This is again about man moving from hunter to also becoming farmer. This is Mesopotamia. Uh, Mesopotamia actually means the land between two rivers, and in this case this is the land between the Tigris and the Euphrates, and this massive crescent of fertile soil between um, the Mediterranean to the west, all the way around to the Persian Gulf to the east. And we were able to farm these landscapes and support ourselves, and thus we were able to start really developing our settlements. And this is one of the first cities, the, the city of Ur, the Sumerian Empire. And the ziggurat you see there on the right uh, now actually is still there. After all those thousands of years, it stands above the desert landscape as a reminder of, of those past civilizations. And we also developed ingenious ways of carrying out agriculture, growing food where water and soil were a scarce resource. And these terraces, the terrace is one of the most brilliant human inventions, I think, um, to conserve water and to conserve our, um, one of our most valuable resources, which is, which is our soil. And you can see here man influencing the very form of the landscape, and actually creating a very beautiful landscape. But it really is a record of toil and subsistence over a, uh, subsistence living over a long time. And the Greeks and the Romans emerged, bringing great culture and knowledge to the world, and fantastic new technologies. And what the Romans were able to do was create infrastructure, so suddenly they could connect their cities through roads, through amazing structures like this aqueduct in France, the Pont de Gare, which still stands today as testament of unbelievable engineering skill. And this meant that the Romans could actually support a city, Rome, of a million people, which was an unbelievable feat, I think, uh, in that time. And in fact, we didn't surpass a million people in a, in a city until London in the Industrial Revolution. So I think that's really a kind of an interesting fact that I found out. And again, these marks in, in the landscape that the Romans made are still with us today, and they began to create man-made landscapes. Rome eventually fell, of course, and in the Middle Ages, cities declined in size. We lost a lot of that technology, we lost a lot of that sophistication. And smaller market towns and cities arose as places to sell produce from, from the surrounding agricultural landscapes. And these cities were very dense, and it's very interesting because I was reading that they're actually dense so that you preserve as much of the valuable agricultural landscape around them as possible. I also think what's interesting about living in a city like this is that as a, as a human, you are very, still very connected with the landscape around. You're still very tied to the natural landscape. And this continued through medieval times. We know that land was centrally controlled by the monarchy, by the church, by warlords. Many towns were defensive places. And people were largely subjugated as peasants within the landscape. But I think the important thing is that people were very, very close to nature. They were in tune with the seasons, they understood how food grew, they understand the value of soil, they understand the value of water, and they understood the value of, of the environment. And as we move out of the Middle Ages, we moved to a period where we really began to dominate the landscape. And the Moors emerged from North Africa as a sophisticated culture, bringing with them beautiful gardens, 
unbelievable new technologies in terms of if you've been to the Alhambra, the water system at the Alhambra is, is incredibly sophisticated. And this really sparked the, the Renaissance. And in a way, Versailles, I think, is the example to use for man's dominance over, over the landscape. As trading grew, the merchant classes grew, those classes, very, very few people in, in, in essence, suddenly had a lot of money on their hands and were able to fund these enormous great visions. I think what's interesting about this is the Renaissance took lots of ideas from ancient Rome and ancient Greece and then imposed these grand geometric designs and orders on the landscape. Here we have Versailles with views into infinity, man controlling landscape, man dominating it and setting it in his own context. And you can see there the people below on the path, I don't know if you've noticed those, but it's just an incredible scale. And of course the Italians and the French were masters of this type of landscape. And the English, we had to do things differently of course, as we always do. And the excuse being that our country is too hilly for all of that geometric stuff. <laughs> but we actually looked at a more ingenious way of, of, of developing landscape design. And here in the picturesque was stirrings, I think, of an interest in, in a more natural environment. But in a way, this is still man dominating the landscape because this scene you see here at Stourhead is entirely man-made. It's an illusion that it's, it's about nature, um, which I think is, is, again, man controlling the landscape. And then we're shifting on again. You see, I've missed places out and things like <coughs> that, but it's impossible. And then for people and their relationship with landscape, everything changed in the Industrial Revolution. A new age uh, dawned, the centralisation of industry at a massive scale, the expansion of railways, huge influx of people into cities, and this whole mass urbanisation began. And we know unbelievable conditions really, squalid conditions, pollution, overcrowding, young children being asked to work in unbelievable places. I think what's interesting about the Industrial Revolution was that we kind of suddenly were disconnected from the world we came from. So our landscape had completely disappeared from our, from our lives and that connection with the natural world and with the way that our genes were set all the way back in the, in the, in the early days was suddenly disappeared. The Victorians, of course, responded to this. Great philanthropists recognised the benefits of bringing the landscape back into the city with the rise of the public park. And this is the first public park uh, in the world. It's, it's Birkenhead Park in Liverpool. And Joseph Paxton, who was the designer of that park, greatly influenced Frederick Law Olmsted, who designed the magnificent Central Park, which is as popular today as it's ever been, and a real icon, I think. So we arrive now where the city is our habitat. So the spark that triggered the Industrial Revolution has continued to this day, and our city has become ever more dense. And it's estimated that most of us, by 2050, 70% of us around the world uh, will be living in cities. So the city has become our principal habitat, where we live now as a species. And whilst there are some well-functioning areas of cities around the world, we also know about massive problems with the conditions that we expect people to endure in them. And I'm sure we've all heard reports even last week about air pollution in London um, and about the conditions um, around the world, in Delhi and in, in, in other places. And these are dangerous conditions for us and not conditions in which we can thrive. And it isn't just air pollution, of course, but we're experiencing problems of flooding, of urban heat. Urban heat is an extremely serious problem for the very young and the very old when we have heat waves. We also have additional deaths. We have problems with drought, we have problems with pollution, we have problems with loss of biodiversity all really creating in many places in cities intolerable conditions for people. And this of course has a knock-on effect. People do not thrive in poor environments. And we're all familiar with reports about obesity, problems of mental health, well-being, and physical inactivity now is being cited or described as a, as a pandemic. And we also have a lack of social integration, we're having inequality, we have poor childhood development. And much of this can be attributed to poor environments and placing people in poor environments because what you're doing is taking them out of the environment that they're, they're designed to live in. And climate change too is costing us and it's costing us significantly. So I think we need to think um, about where we are now. I hope the ending of this talk will get a little bit nicer, don't worry. 
but I think we can all contribute to better cities. Mass urbanisation. We have to think about mass urbanisation. It's only been with us, really, around the world for the last 200, 250 years. So the city, in a way, is an experiment. And we have this long history of living in the landscape. If you just take us as the hunter-gatherer, 100,000 years, and only 250 of that is living in this new environment. And research tells us that because of this, we're designed to be connected with nature. We need to be connected with it in our daily lives. There's an awful lot of research on this now. And you can see here, humans evolved in a natural setting. So connection to nature is at the core of our identity as a species and of our well-being. I think there's the key phrase there is the core of our identity. So once you place people in poor environments, we begin to lose our identity. And this is why we feel uncomfortable and we feel unthreatened in poor urban environments. And why we thrive in the environment that you see there on that slide, which is Central Park. More research. Dr. William Bird, who's an ex-GP and is now a consultant, has carried out some incredible research on this. If you place people with nature, put them in better environments, you can help with all of these things you see. You can see it helps anxiety, stress, it helps crime, better environments reduce crime, improves childhood development, it improves hospital environments and speeds up um, recovery times. It helps with well-being, mental health, strengthening communities, all of these things. So, what we need is a new landscape for the city. And I think we need to think about the city in a, in a different way. My question at the start was, what are we, the present generation, writing in the landscape? I think we have to think about that. And I think the answer is that if we're to thrive in a city environment, we need to think that the city can be a very, very different place. And this is Paris on Car Free Day. This is where the people are in charge. And I, thought I think the stop sign is actually rather nice in the middle of all that. <laughs> and I believe that landscape can now create a new kind of livable city. And Diana Balmurray, who's a well-known American landscape architect, puts it very nicely. She says that we need to put the city in nature. So in other words, that we need to, we need to, to not necessarily put nature in the city, but we need our cities to sit in nature so that the systems of nature can all work positively for us. And so in terms of climate proofing, in terms of providing buffers from extreme weather, in terms of providing healthy, livable environments, and also purifying the basic elements that are so important to our survival, our water, soil and air. All of these elements are much maligned in cities, of course. And this is landscape not as decoration, like we saw earlier, star ahead, uh, but landscape as a functioning system. So working ecosystems of water, of plants, of soil, that span the city and create places and corridors through it that will support healthy living for urban dwellers. Using our space on our buildings, treating our streets so that they're places that people would like to be. So we have to get landscape to work in our cities like systems in nature to clean our air, clean our water and clean our soil, supporting biodiversity and addressing the effects of climate change. And landscape is the real key to, to doing this. The amazing thing about functioning ecosystems is you can build them and they will do all of these things. We can help reduce air pollution, we can create habitat, we can provide places for urban food, we can provide safe walking and cycling networks, we can find space, social and cultural interaction, flood storage, etc, etc, storm protection, all of these things. And if we can weave the landscape back into the city and make the city sit in landscape, and then we can have a, a network of ecosystems so the landscape can become a protective and supporting structure for all urban citizens. And this would work in any city around the world. Working ecosystems will, will help your air, will help your water, will help your soil. So we need places where we can provide protection and routes through. We need safe places for people to cycle and to walk through the city. And we need places where people can rest and relax, large and small. And I think there's a great thing about landscape is that if you plant a tree, and I've deliberately used this slide because this is Fitzroy Square up the road, those trees have been there probably 170 or 200 years. So you plant a large species tree and you're really creating a legacy for the future. And you're, you're really investing in people. And that's what you're writing in the landscape. You're writing the future in the landscape. And we need to think of landscape not as a nuisance and something that's costing us money on projects, but something that is an investment in the future and something that we leave behind as valuable for future generations. 
So this is hopefully the more uplifting section of the talk. <laughs> um, and I'm really, what I'm, trying, what I'm trying to do here really is say that we can all really help with this because we can have grand plans. Uh, they're very difficult to do a grand plan for a city top down. We have to kind of go ground up and we also have to go with all the projects we're involved with, with all of us who plan and design our cities, we need to all kind of contribute and we need to do it incrementally and we can do it. And I, I think uh, it's about all working together. So I'm going to start with the streets. And this is the number of people, this is the amount of space to take 72 people around the city. And you can see, actually if you look to the left of the bus, that's just walking. And then we have the bus, public transport, cycling, and the car. The car takes up enormous amounts of city space. Enormous, you can see there. And also pollutes the air and is dangerous and noisy. And we need to be much more courageous, I think. We need to really start thinking about it. Some of us who are working on large infrastructure projects, I think, can take some lessons from Madrid. This is the Madrid-Rio scheme. Here they buried 43 kilometres of, of motorway and created these beautiful, healthy parks above. This is now a healthy environment for residents and also for tourists. And of course, with tourists in Madrid, this is economic gain for the city. So that investment, will, they, will, they will more than get their money's worth, I think, in, in the end. If we can't bury the car, we can make it share our space. And I think shared spaces work well. They're self-policing, cars naturally slow down. And this is how we want our streets now. We want, um, we want people in them. We want people cycling taking their dog for a walk, sitting, walking, sitting in the sun, sitting in the shade, and becoming real places that, that, that we want to stay in and dwell in. And this is all will help with the economy of those streets, of course, as well. But it's about creating space for people. And this is Wagbahn in Germany, in Freiburg, and this is a, a car-free district. So when we look at development and we're thinking about our master plans, can we rethink the car out of them? And Wagbahn is very interesting. You actually have to declare whether you own a car or not. And if you declare that you own a car, you have to buy a parking space in a multi-storey car park on the edge of the district. So um, I think that's a brilliant idea, really. And suddenly we have a city here which is designed for people, which is safe, which is healthy, which is pollution-free, which works um, to protect us from climate change. And even their tramway, you can see there, has permeable surfacing to help with water, to help clean the soil. And in South America, I think they're beginning to really think hard about their environments. They have massive problems of pollution. This is car-free day in Mexico. Every Sunday, no cars in the city. They're banned uh, and people come in. And of course, I think this probably uplifts their economy enormously. Um, and I think it's, you think, why can't we do this in London? Next Sunday, car-free Sunday, every day, every Sunday. And Copenhagen is the best example, I think, since since the 70s, Copenhagen have been making their city into a place for people. Uh, they have more cycle commuters than drivers now. And they also have a, a car-free centre. And you can see on that slide, you can see where the roads used to be. But now, this place is for people. So our streets can become uh, places that we all want to be in. And we have to invest in our public space. This is King's Cross. And investing in our public space is really investing in people. People will dwell with uh, knock-on economic benefits. And we need to create spaces that protect us from the climate. So spaces with large species, trees, leaving a legacy, bringing water in, creating places for children to play, and great places that can cool the air, and places that you'd like to go and visit on a, on a very hot day. And in our projects, we can think about pop-up parks. These are popping up around the world. And you can see this one here, I think this one's in Sydney, and this is occupying parking spaces. So we're actually occupying the road space there. And again, this is all part of social integration, part of getting people on the streets, partly uh, part of urban city life, healthy urban city life. And even better if we could make the park wider and get rid of those cars altogether. And we need to invest in our obsolete infrastructure, find all the spaces in the city. The city is under great pressure in terms of space, and in terms of competition, if you like, from development and from utilities and all of these sort of things. But we need to find space for people within that. We need to put people first. The High Line, as we know, is a massive economic success in New York and a brilliant place to visit. Absolutely fantastic place in summer or winter. And every time I've been there, it's been absolutely packed with people. And people staying and dwelling and then 
cafes popping up and places to eat. And suddenly it's a big, social, fantastic place. And I think in terms of tourist value, I'm sure many people go to New York simply to visit the High Line now. So it's a powerful thing. And repurposing their old pier areas, again in New York, and this again has been proved to be a massive success. So again, thinking about all those obsolete places in cities. And our parks and open spaces. This is the Olympic Park. And we should be seeing our parks in the UK as assets. They're under massive pressure at the moment. They're being sold off by some local authorities. And this is the opposite of what we should really be doing. The Olympic Park was created, of course, as part of a large infrastructure project. And it was actually, I think, a courageous decision to make the park the centrepiece for the Olympic Games, because that's the, that's the space that then drives all the regeneration that we see going on around there. And the park has built in climate change resilience. So these spaces are all designed to flood and weave biodiversity in. And you can see there, looking further north, the park is highly functional. So you can see the raised paths there in these areas which, which deliberately flood to help the city. And this is what we should be doing with our other parks, our Victorian parks. We should be retrofitting them so that they are more functional and more useful for the future. We can, of course, at the same time, build in biodiversity. We can build in cycleways. We can build in paths. We can link these paths up to wider city networks and create healthy places for people. And we arrive at buildings. We're near the end now. And I think buildings can make a huge contribution. So when we think about our building designs, can we do this? I think this is a fantastic project. I really do. The Bosco Verticale. I mean, imagine living in a flat that you feel like you're living in a park. I mean, I think that's a, a pretty brilliant <laughs> uh, solution. I mean, maybe don't have to go that far, but we can think about how we can retrofit our walls. We have the technology now, with superb technology now, to do green walls. They don't have to be uh, expensive to maintain. We have to get the right plants, and then we have to get the right systems in there. Again, this wall here, this is London's largest green wall down in Victoria. This is highly functional. Not only does it look attractive, biodiverse, but it stores uh, water and also helps with, with air pollution as well. And this is being retrofitted onto a hotel. We have enormous amounts of roof space in cities, enormous amounts. We can make these useful for habitats, for slowing down water, storing water. We can make them places for people offices with urban farming above them, helping with social interaction, helping a uh, healthy workforce, and all of those sorts of things. And this is an example in Victoria, because you may well say, well, I'm only designing one building, what difference can that make? And I think this is the key, really, that if we all kind of work towards a healthier city, you can see just in that area of Victoria, this was a study that the uh, Business Improvement District, the BID, did down there, which I think is really interesting. Here's 25 hectares of roof space, usable space in a very dense, hard urban part of the city. And that's greater than the area of St. James's Park. So multiply that up over the city, and suddenly you have another 10 parks, which all will function and will give you, will give you benefits for people. And that's why even valuable small spaces like this, this is a B&B hotel at St. Hermitage, which I think is a brilliant scheme by Farrell's. And even spaces on buildings where you normally just wouldn't think about it. Let's bring those in. Bees don't take up much space, but we know their value in terms of, of, of pollination and in terms of life. And they, bees are really struggling at the moment. I'm going to finish here. And I want to finish on this photo, which is a Tocha station in Madrid. And I think it really shows how we need to redefine our city spaces and sometimes surprise people by what we do so we can bring in a botanic garden where you wouldn't expect to find one, or bring in beautiful landscapes from all around the world. And if you see this, is, is, is really making sure that people are in contact with nature as a part of their daily lives. And I think we can all contribute towards that. Um, so that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, sorry, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Don't ask difficult ones. You can. Thank you. Um, I think, yeah, what you know, we are showing here, I think it's a really fantastic idea. And a lot of the pictures you've shown for green roofs and green parks, things, a lot of them are um, like very well developed countries. I was just wondering, do you think there's 
it's basically kind of developing countries to kind of incorporate this, or is it rather a sense of saying you need to let them develop like we did and then consider it? Yeah, that's a good, very good question. Um, I mean, the, the reason for showing the images I did were because I, what I wanted to do is inspire you as an audience in your planning, when you're planning and, and, and designing projects to bring in this into your projects. I was trying to relate it to, to the projects you may, may work on. Um, I think the fundamental thing is that if we can get working ecosystems into any city, into developing countries, cities, uh, that that's, that's the value that landscape has because we can use those systems to look after the water, look after the air, and look after the soil. And those are the essentials of, of life and the essentials of healthy environments. And the big thing, I think, with landscape is it's, it's often cheaper than more traditional systems. If you think about big engineered structures for, for water retention, you can substitute that with, a, with a reed bed systems and those sorts of things, which are, are probably more fit with developing countries and the way that they work. So I think the principles, the principles of introducing landscape back into our city and part of our daily lives is, is the important thing. And to make sure that that landscape is highly functional. So we think about the systems of nature. And what we're really using is the power of nature. We're really um, harnessing the power of nature to make healthy places. So yes, I, I do think it, it, it applies everywhere in the world. Thank you. Yeah. Could we also add in the issue of food production? Because I know, for example, the bees in Soho some of the companies then uh, bottle it and sell it to the, to the employees. And I know one Italian restaurant that he grows his own herbs. Um, because A, because he thinks they're better, and B, it saves all the transport. Is there more potential for some of this landscape to include uh, localised food production? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think people are fascinated by growing things, uh, generally. And I think that the bee example you gave is, is fantastic. I, I talked to um, somebody from Bermondsey Bees, he does a, a talk called, what's it called, the talk called, it's got a brilliant title, uh, Bees Can't Eat Kind Words, I think is the title of his <laughs> presentation, I think is brilliant. And he was talking about he, how he's got prizes for the honey that he produces, and this is all around the Bermondsey area, um, and I think the brilliant thing with, with all of that sort of stuff, food growing, is we can use the space on our roofs, we can use a very small space to actually produce food, and produce really high quality product. And he was saying how he's won national <coughs> awards for honey production. Um, and he's very, very proud of all these awards, and, and rightly so. Um, and I think that's the, that's the beauty of it. A very, very small space like the one we saw on the building, I think becomes a very valuable space in our cities if we can make it all work, and if we can make sure that people get the opportunity um, to do those things. So yes, I absolutely agree. And I think there's a social aspect to it all as well. I think, you know, uh, if you imagine an office with, a, with a, a roof garden that could just simply be left with planters and soil, and then the office workers can come in. They will, they will, plant, they will plant them up. They, it'll become a social place. It'll become maybe a place you even have meetings. And maybe we have our meetings not in horrible meeting rooms with plastic walls, but we may have me our meetings in beautiful gardens you know, in the future. So we have to, kind of, as I say, we have to think differently about what we, we, we're doing. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah. I'm just wondering about maintenance because um, all these uh, elements you've shown, they're very well organized and maintained. Um, I mean, I come from a dry country, so I remember trying to do gardens before and they always fell apart. So it cost a lot of money to redo them over and over again until in the end we gave up and we just have a stone garden now. <laughs> so I'm just wondering, um, or cactuses. Yeah. <laughs> I should have a bit of an expert in cacti. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just wondering about the maintenance because it, it takes time and I guess water as well to maintain all this. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, the way I, I look at the whole maintenance issue is that the landscape within the city, if we make it a functional element of the city, it's providing a service for us in many ways in terms of cleaning water or providing biodiversity and all those things. And it's providing a service for health and well-being for people. And in the same way that you, in, really in the same way that a traffic light provides a service, you wouldn't dream of not um, maintaining a traffic light or a drainage system. So I think, you know, we need to, again, think differently. We need to think that this landscape is providing us with all of these benefits and we need to invest money in to maintain it. And I think your example is interesting, actually. 
Um, I think I th I actually quite like stone gardens and things like that. Uh, and but again, you know, if you have very little water, it's all about right plant, right place. So you have to assess the water you have and then design your planting. And in a way, that's a, a beautiful thing because if you don't have much water, then your garden will will still be beautiful because it will reflect what can grow in that environment, which may be a rocky, stony place with with some some uh, cacti, um, but they will flower eventually. Uh, maybe only for one day. Um, <laughs> but uh, but again, it's it's about really working with nature. So I think you have to look at the environment that you're you're putting things in. And I say it's always right plant, right place. And you can make some of these green walls very low maintenance. And, you know, and again, it's about choosing the right species and choosing stuff that maybe will survive drought conditions uh, and, and that sort of thing. So I think that's the advice, really. You've been talking a lot about uh, landscape in an urban context. And given that uh, a lot of urban agglomerations are kind of growing in size, there's also, there are these places where people are coming from where the densities are going down. What, what is your thinking on, on that? Is there anything on reclaiming nature in, in those places? Yeah, I mean, I think I didn't actually discuss that, did I? But these, these are cities which are declining where populations are moving out. Um, again, I think that uh, I, I did some interesting work with Kingston University. We were looking at how we could make sure that um, the city still survived <coughs> that great change. And I think one of the things we were looking at was making sure that, that the landscape survived in the streets. And we, we, we were looking at things like replanting derelict sites um, and greening those, so just to make sure that the city still feels full, uh, feels at least occupied by plants and feels that nature's sort of helping people in, in, in that way, really. I think, it's, I think what happens is, is cities can quickly become dilapidated if they're, if they're, if they're not uh, looked after properly. So I think you've got to kind of make sure that uh, you, you put something in. And really, if you think about a derelict site, simply reseeding it, hydro-seeding it, uh, and with the right seed mix, you'll get something beautiful. They did this in Philadelphia. Um, on all their derelict sites, um, they, they uplifted the whole community because they went around each derelict site and, and replanted them with these amazing grasses and suddenly they became places for kids to play and people to go. And again, they had benefit because they were, they were slowing rainwater down, they were, they were protecting, they were reducing, reducing uh, solar gain and all of those sorts of things. So I think again, it's, you know, the landscape holds the key, I think, to that. And it's very, very cheap. Landscape stuff is so cheap. <laughs> so cheap, <laughs> so cheap. We've got one more question. Okay. I guess other than maintenance, what do you see as the biggest barriers to, to adoption? Because there's lots of ideas out there, but um, why are the 27 hectares in Victoria not as green as you proposed, or as the Victoria bid proposed? Yeah. I think it will be eventually. Yeah. Um, I think the biggest barrier really is just knowledge, really. I think just us all pulling together. I think we're kind of you know, the car's sort of dominated and we're just headed off in one direction. I think we have to just stop and rethink, like the slide with the car-free Paris. We have to stop and think we can do, we can make our cities differently. And we need to make some big courageous moves. We need to make some small moves. We have to think that all city space is valuable, large and small. We have to take the opportunity uh, during infrastructure projects to make some big courageous moves where we have money and where we can make those big changes. And on our everyday projects, we have to think, how can I use all the space on this building, for example? <laughs> you know, it's easy just to put some gravel on the roof, isn't it? You know, um, but, uh, but, but if, we, if we can actually be more creative in the use of our space, and if we can think about, I suppose in a way, it, it, the thought is, let's design things for people. Let's design them so that people will benefit in some way. And I think landscape is the key to that. I thought it was a really, really interesting talk. I hadn't really considered, um, really, I think the main thing that we came across is how easy a lot of the things he said they are to implement. So uh, in the case of green roofs that we've seen kind of happening a lot kind of across Europe, as a client side you know, company and people kind of throughout you know, especially UK at the moment, we're very much focused on profits and turnover and you don't really consider how things like this can actually benefit you. 
um, and these things can often be seen as a drawback. Um, but I think actually it's quite important to consider things like green roofs and pedestrianising areas. They don't have to come at a cost and they shouldn't be seen as a, as a drawback. It should be seen as an extra thing that we can do on top to benefit you know, the environment and especially running through that, the economy. It's always good to be reminded of kind of essential things that you should consider in, in design and in the built environment and uh, his passion as well for his subject shone through and I think there's that that always inspires you is someone seeing somebody else's passion for their subject and their knowledge of it and you think yes how can I employ that how can I use that so uh, yeah, it was in, literally inspiring. We have two or three projects where we we need to rethink how we are thinking of the landscape and uh, its role in the building and how it functions, but also chiefly how people enjoy it, how they engage with it. Uh, that, that's crucial for the success of the building. I, I think Tom delivered a fantastic presentation, again at Arabs, as usual. Um, very informative. I, I, I like the piece that he did, the, the, the trees, and uh, were not just for decoration. You know, it is part of a working ecosystem. And as cost consultants, we should uh, embrace that. And I'd like to think that we can bring optioneering into the day-to-day -day schemes rather than value engineering. Um, it's typically, you know, uh, as cost consultants, we're brought in to uh, drive the value through the project. But I think it's important that we're involved at the beginning, at the infancy of the design, so we can actually incorporate these um, ecosystems into the design. Well, I was very inspired, a bit biased, I'm a landscape architect myself, and um, I think it's very, very important to implement sort of green infrastructure, green environment, looking at the health benefits of landscape. What's important is not only having that translated into pushing the developers to implement it through the uh, sort of local authority, but understanding the value of this landscape, the return on the investment also for the actual developer, and how we understand that is by doing more research um, and how it actually brings people to buy these spaces that are more green. And that kind of links in and kind of closes a circle. I think it's very important. You can't just impose it on one side, but you have to see it from the benefit, the like overarching benefit, you know, and how people perceive living in a beautiful space as being something they are prepared to um, pay more for and have more of a market so I think it comes both ways and I definitely think there should be more research on that.